when we were organizing this conference, it, it's very much in the air about uh, really a huge change in academic thinking, I think, over the last several years. Once upon a time, economists thought we shouldn't invest in places, we should invest in people. And uh, they rather heartlessly thought if you were a person who lived in a place that was bad, well, you should move somewhere else. But I think in the last several, well, for a fact, in the last several years, the thinking has changed on that. And there's much more realization that everybody is not going to leave Flint, Michigan, and that the disparities between the successful and unsuccessful places uh, in America has grown and has become a source of both economic and political concern. So that is the origins of this panel. And Tracy Gordon from the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center is going to moderate it. Um, Congressman Kildee from uh, Michigan is going to join us, but uh, one of Wessel's principles is never hold up anything waiting for some member of Congress to show up. Uh, so we're going to keep that principle. Um, one thing I just want to ask is that, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, we're very interested in having people, particularly practitioners and public sector officials, identify questions that wouldn't it be nice if some researcher spent some time answering this. So if you happen to have a question like that in the back of your mind and you'd love to see some academic researcher dive into it, just write a note and leave it at the desk outside and we'll try and find uh, somebody to do it. It's the best way I can think of to crowdsource research questions uh, that might help us make this conference more useful. So with that, Tracy Gordon. Thanks, David. It's a Hello. Thanks, David. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm really looking forward to this panel. Um, a couple of years ago, can you all hear me? This doesn't sound very loud. Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, Ryan Avent at The Economist memorably wrote, how do you solve a problem like Ohio? And, uh, and the answer used to be, just you wait. So basically a confluence of Rogers and Hammerstein and Lynn manuel Miranda. Um, but the idea, as David said, among economists was that places would catch up, catch up with each other. And research that was actually presented at this conference a couple of years ago shows that regional income convergence is slowing down. So it used to be that businesses would go to places that uh, had cheap labor and cheap land and invest, and the income in those places would go up. Um, and that's not happening as much, and people are not moving from place to place anymore. So we're going to discuss some of those issues and what it means for all of you uh, who like to build things and have uh, thriving and stable communities um, in which to invest um, and what we should be doing about it. So I'll introduce our panel. We have Chris Berry, who is the William J. and Alicia Townsend Friedman Professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. He directs the Municipal Finance Program and uh, the Master of Science Program in Computational Analysis and Public Policy. Um, I think I know a few graduates of that program, actually, and they're really fantastic contributors to the field. Um, next to him, we have Tim Bartik, who is the senior economist, a senior economist at the WEF John Institute for Employment Research. He wrote Who Benefits from State and Local Economic Development and is widely cited um, because of a fantastic database that he's put together, in addition to his um, very rigorous research on local economic development incentives. Um, and next to him, we have Professor Ingrid Ellen from, I'm going to give her fancy title in a second. She is the Paulette Goddard Professor of Urban Policy and Planning at NYU's Wagner School of Public Service and faculty director of the NYU Furman Center. Um, and everyone has written many books and has illustrious degrees, and you should consult their bios to find out more about that. OK, so um, I'll start with a general question for everyone on the panel. Then we'll have a little bit of a moderated discussion, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, so hardly a day goes by that we don't read something about places that are falling behind. There was a fantastic, um, probably produced by one of your graduates, um, data visualization uh, in the New York Times that talked about the returns to moving from the Deep South to Silicon Valley for a lawyer versus a janitor. And basically, the janitor that moves would see all of uh, his or her wage gains eaten away by housing costs, whereas the lawyer would actually see some benefit to moving. Um, so there's just so much out there in the ether about um, the different fortunes of places. Um, what's going on? <laughs> uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll take a first shot at saying something um, about this. So just to unpack a little bit what you, uh, Tracy, began with around this question of regional income convergence. So for, a, I don't know, most of the, at least the 20th century, uh, economists and others really believed that there was uh, 
a natural tendency towards places that had been left behind to, to catch up, and that places that initially started with, say, low income or low wages grew faster than places that had started with high income and high wages. Um, and over the course of time, there would be sort of a natural process that would, that would equalize these across place. Probably the leading example of this is the American South over the course of the 20th century that went from being relatively, you know, uh, less industrialized and lower income compared to the rest of the country, and then over the course of a pretty long time, uh, caught up. And uh, the underlying forces that, that drove that were um, the migration of people. So people tend to move towards places with high incomes, and at the same time, firms and capital tend to move towards places with uh, lower wages and lower housing values, and those two forces being at work jointly uh, lead to this kind of kind of equalization that had been present for such a long time. And I think there's now pretty widespread agreement that that process has stopped, at least as a phenomenon within the United States. There's maybe some disagreement about exactly when it stopped. Um, I've done some research saying it stopped in the 80s, other people say in the 90s, but uh, whatever, whatever it may be, I don't think anyone um, disagrees with the basic idea that this regional convergence is no longer happening and maybe even has been reversed such that we now see uh, places that start out uh, being better off, uh, re whether these are regions or MSAs or even um, uh, subparts of MSAs that start off being better off, in fact, grow faster. Um, and part of this has to do with the uh, attraction of high-skilled people. So what we see is <clears throat> high-skilled people tend to increasingly be concentrating in a relatively small number of locations that are already populated by high-skilled people. So the kind of highly educated places get uh, more so uh, highly educated. And there's some, uh, I would say, well, everyone agrees this is happening with the exact reason why this convergence has stopped is the subject of still a lot of ongoing research. Some people think it has a lot to do with housing costs, preventing this kind of migration that we talked about. Others think it's partly to do with globalization and certain types of jobs leaving the um, United States. Still others, uh, I've argued that it has to do with just the, the nature of job creation and entrepreneurship and innovation and a knowledge economy versus a manufacturing economy. Um, so I think all of these things are going on. I don't think it's one, uh, one explanation. But all of these factors uh, have led to the end of regional convergence, which means places are, in fact, uh, moving apart and are more different than they have been historically. And we can be less confident that there'll be some natural economic process that will solve that. Sorry, I just want to butt in and introduce the congressman. Um, so Dan Kildee just joined us. Thank you very much. Um, he's a, a lifelong Michigander, born and raised in Flint. Um, he serves on the Ways and Means and Budget Committees of Congress. Um, he is the founder of the Center for Community Progress, um, a national nonprofit um, focused on urban land reform, and he also founded Michigan's first land bank. He has spoken extensively on places and towns um, and what the federal government could do about them, so we're going to hear from him later about that. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Sorry. So to go back to the question that Tracy posed, which is why is there all of a sudden so much talk about place-based policy? Um, part of what Chris um, was saying, that there is increasing evidence that place disparities aren't going away, that uh, some areas have much lower employment population ratios than others, and that seems to be quite persistent. I think another part of it is there's a growing realization that what we currently do in place-based policy isn't working very well. So what do we currently do? The main thing we currently do in place-based policy are business tax incentives offered by state and local governments. These incentives have uh, tripled from 1990 to the present, roughly. They're now about 45, 50 billion a year. If you look at things like the Foxconn deal in Wisconsin, the Foxconn offer per job or as a percent of wages was roughly 10 times the current average deal in the US. So the current average deal in the US is roughly equivalent to giving a 3% wage subsidy to a company for 20 years. Foxconn was over 30% of wages for 20 years. So. Now, currently at $50 billion a year, that's real money. You know, at some point, billions are real money. Uh, if, we, if incentives went up tenfold in the U.S. to $500 billion a year, they clearly would significantly impede the ability of state and local governments to do infrastructure, to do schools, to do universities, to do anything else. 
So I think people are aware of the fact there's a problem here. We're doing these policies. They're very wasteful. Uh, a lot of them aren't very effective. They only tip a minority of the, the incentive firms. So in a lot of cases, you're not really having much effect. You're not really affecting job growth as much. The cost per job is pretty high. Uh, they're not very well targeted. I mean, non-distressed places use them as well as distressed places. Uh, Indiana's incentives are twice as high as Illinois's. South Carolina's are twice as high as North Carolina. Why? You know, politics, political accidents, history, lots of things has nothing to do with uh, one area being more distressed than others. That's also true within states. So they're not well targeted distressed areas. They're not well targeted uh, at firms that would provide either create more jobs or have higher multiplier effects or that pay higher wages or are more likely to employ local residents. Pretty much, you know, once state and local areas start doing this, they hand out these incentives to everyone. They do not target them very well. So we have a significant problem. We're, we already are actually devoting a lot of resources to place-based policy in the U.S. We're just not devoting it, doing it in a very smart way. So um, now I think there are things that can be done that are more effective, and I think I'll try to get that later on in response to questions. But uh, I think the, one of the key to answer the question directly, why are we so concerned about place-based policy? Because we have a problem? And our current solution isn't coming close to being working and to being effective. So, um, I'd like to turn this on. Okay, great. Now you can hear me. All right. Good morning. Um, um, I, I I just want to add one thing. I completely agree. First of all, with with um, everything that Chris and Tim has have said, um, but I, I do want to just add one thing, which I also think we have growing evidence that the the sort of the, the effect of of mass layoffs and um, and job loss in in communities are, are sort of a much harsher and more persistent than I think we previously understood so I, I think that there's there's also new evidence that these disparities really matter um, but but I want to switch gears slightly because I feel like a little bit of an oddball on this panel is that my work is really focused on neighborhoods um, and so I want to, and I think actually, although there's probably, there hasn't been as much of a shift in sort of attention towards place-based policies directed at poor neighborhoods, I, I think that there, there has been um, something of a shift. And I want to talk about the roots of why that's happening, which is a slightly different question. Um, and, I, and I think the drive, um, I, I think it's part of it is that as cities and coastal cities in particular are attracting more high-income, college-educated households. I think that the the uh, there's there is uh, growing concern about about inequality within cities, and and you know you've you've seen this in um, certainly in Mayor De Blasio's campaign, but you've also seen that sort of other mayors around the country, progressive mayors, have been running on platforms to really try to drive a more inclusive um, inclusive economic growth, um, like you know. Um, uh, Mayor uh, Gorsetti, Mayor uh, Lightfoot in Chicago. So I think you've, 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 uh, you're, you're beginning to see that sort of a greater concern about inequality within cities. I, I want to sort of step back for a second and say that I, I actually think holding the overall level of inequality constant, I actually think we should probably be less concerned about inequality within jurisdictions than inequality across jurisdictions, right? Inequality within jurisdictions is also diversity economic diversity within jurisdictions. It obviously means a ro more robust tax base um, that is, is there to address, um, to you know, make sure that um, schools are, are good and that uh, there's services, adequate services for, for low-income residents. Um, but I do think there's sort of growing concern. And secondly, I, I think that there is, you know, said, I think that the growing presence of, of higher income households in, um, in cities, in particular so coastal cities, does put upward pressure on, on land prices and therefore housing costs, and we're seeing um, renters paying increasing shares of their of their incomes on housing costs around the country. Not only low income households, but moderate income. That sort of it, those rent burdens are sort of climbing up the income spectrum, and I think that's leading to sort of an an increased concern. Like, why is it that my housing prices are going up so much? And and some of that is um, people are pointing to to um, to the presence of, of um, higher income households, to the presence of, of um, 
of new and that sort of inequality within within jurisdictions. Um, a third thing is again, I think we we have new evidence that has been, I think, fairly it's certainly within academic circles, but also um, you know uh, uh, outside um, that that neighborhoods really matter. That that neighborhoods profoundly shape the long-term chances of children, and that's mostly from the Moving to Opportunity um, demonstration program that showed that, that low-income children whose families received housing vouchers to move to low-poverty areas um, earned significantly higher incomes as young adults. They were significantly more likely to attend college, to complete college, and so we have, you know, we have a, you know, really rigorous evidence now that that, that neighborhoods matter. And, and despite, and I should also say that sort of despite the, um, the sort of the, the media's, uh, I think, focus on, the mainstream media's focus on, on gentrification, um, you know, low-income neighborhoods in the United States are much more likely to remain deeply poor than they are to gentrify across the country. And um, poverty concentration in neighborhoods actually grew has grown in the last two decades. 14% uh, of poor residents of metropolitan areas now live in, in very high, extremely high poverty neighborhoods. That's up from 10% in 2000. And poor children are even more likely to live in, in high poverty neighborhoods. So um, I do think that um, there, there, there is reason to be, in particular, maybe the, the, the strongest reason to be concerned about, I think there's reason to be concerned, let me just say, about sort of neighborhood disparities with, within jurisdictions. So, Congressman, I let off by asking, why is there so much attention to place-based policies now? Why now? <clears throat> You're apparently unfamiliar with where I work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I mean, there is some discussion, but I, I don't see a lot of that translating in a meaningful way, at least in terms of um, U.S. policy at this point uh, to really significant place-based investments. But I do think it's important, and I think particularly when thinking about how many of the incentives that are intended to move population or move capital or, or incentivize investment um, are utilized, uh, while intentionally perhaps they are place-based, there are a lot of consequences that come with the strategy that I think still leaves um, a whole subset of American communities behind. Um, and we just look, for example, at the most recent federal uh, set of policies, which I know many of you, I'm sure, have been diving into as much as some of us, and it's the Opportunity Zone. Right church, wrong pew. Um, I mean, th obviously, I think we believe that there is a very strong need to incentivize investment in the most distressed places. But what that policy assumes just like a lot of policy at the federal level, is that there's a natural tendency for those policies to achieve their intended goal, even if the policy itself isn't so explicit in getting us there. So we're trying to figure out a way if there is a, a path to get much more focus, and I know this is part of the discussion that has been going on, much more focus and a much more significant uh, targeting of these sorts of incentives, which is spending through the tax code into the more and very most distressed places. That's, that's, I think, one problem that I see is that this assumption that, uh, that the incentives naturally do flow to the most distressed places when actually where they flow to are the places with the highest rate of return that minimally qualify for the standards that the policy creates in order to be as in inclusive enough to get political will behind it. Um, so I'll start with that. I think the other piece of it, which may or may not touch directly on your question but can't be uh, ignored, is that I think a lot of the focus when it comes to place-based does go around the issue of the important issue of how we incentivize private investment, how do we create um, opportunity for people who live in these places as a result of new private investment finding its way into places that need, uh, need that sort of help. Ignoring, I think, that for one set of the communities, one subset of the communities that we're talking about, there's a conversation that needs to take place long before that. 
because in many places in this country, and I happen to represent one and I'm a, a product of one, uh, my hometown of Flint, we're experiencing a kind of austerity that I don't think anyone really fully understands unless you're there to experience it. A kind of fiscal austerity that means in these places, forget about incentives for new investment, there's a whole set of communities in this country right now that do not have the basic elements of a civil society in place. So the Flint water crisis is fairly well known. I mean, we know what happened there, right? It's not about water. It's about the fact that we have a broken municipal finance system in a lot of states that has the revenue base so localized and so volatile that as a community goes through the natural ebb and flow of economic cycles, there's no way to stop the downward spiral because the loss of necessary public services exacerbates the, the underlying conditions and, and, and diminishes the quality of life to a place that it's almost hard to describe. And so when we talk about place-based strategies, I think we need to think about, number one, particularly at the federal level, whether we're willing or have the political will to actually create the sort of targeting that gets the resource where it needs to go. But a predecessor to that is whether the places we're talking about are in a position to advantage themselves of whatever the incentives are because they have that fundamental basic level of what a civil society is comprised of. And what we have in Flint, you know, the water crisis was just one example of a whole series of failures that's one that everybody understands and everybody knows about, but it's a community that doesn't, doesn't have those, doesn't have parks that are maintained or mowed, has schools that are deteriorated to the point where uh, there are 15,000 school-aged children in Flint, 4,000 Flint, uh, the, the Flint schools has 4,000 of them, the most difficult to teach, the most unsupported population. So we have this really big institutional failure that is staring us in the face. And I think if we try to deal with it with just better, quicker, faster transactional approaches to it and don't really accept the fact that there's a bigger, much bigger, much deeper underlying problem, and that is the broken system of funding essential services in cities that are struggling, then I think all of the conversations about the <coughs> intervention strategies are going to miss the mark. So I think um, the representative has spoken very movingly about the difficulties facing some of these communities. The federal government spends $4 trillion a year, about $700 billion a year on state and federal grants. The federal government is very powerful, but this is really hard from an economic perspective. So before we even get to the political challenges, Chris, why is it so difficult economically to help places that are in trouble? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> uh, so I guess let me uh, start by saying why I think place-based policies have traditionally in kind of the textbook uh, treatment in economics been not, uh, not looked upon very favorably. And I think, you know, Tim already gave one reason, which is not kind of the textbook reason, but I say some of these just, just don't work very well and the policy is not effective. But that's actually I think most of the skepticism uh, of place-based policies is a skepticism of what would happen, in fact, if they did work well. Um, and the traditional, uh, you know, sources of skepticism are, are twofold. One is that a successful place-based policy often ends up helping people who are different from those who were targeted or who were the motivation for the policy. Um, so a really successful place-based policy, so for instance, a policy that, that made a place very desirable and improved uh, uh, the amenities or the quality of the jobs or what have you will often attract new people who want to move there and end up raising the prices. And so the people who benefit may be the landowners in the area, but the act, if your goal was not to benefit the landowners, but to benefit uh, the renters or the residents, then often you know, the more successful <laughs> your project is, uh, the more you end up helping some other group of people because uh, those people move in. Um, and again, that's conditional on the, not, not the failed strategies that Tim was talking about, but one that actually worked. If Amazon HQ2 had landed in Flint somehow, uh, you know, how much would the people of Flint have benefited from that versus, you know, a bunch of new residents who are likely to have moved there and taken advantage of those jobs. That's reason number one. 
Uh, reason number two is, you know, again, if you believe that migration is an important part of this process of regional convergence, you know, incentivizing people to stay into a place that seems to be structurally failing um, is not going to be effective. Um, uh, and is going to, in fact, slow down the process of, 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 of convergence. Um, and then finally, you know, I think the reality is that uh, while regional disparities are increasing, it's still a relatively small share of inequality is like between places. Most inequality is still, and I think Ingrid was kind of alluding to this, is kind of still within places. So even if you could cure a lot of like between place um, inequality, you, you, you wouldn't have made a huge dent in the, in the, in the overall problem. So. Um, I guess that's why, you know, even if you had a really effective policy, it would be hard to be sure that it helped the people you wanted it to help. And that doesn't answer the question of, you know, why don't we have such a set of really effective policies that we should be even worrying about this? So, Tim, as the guru of local economic development incentive data, <laughs> um, you've, you've taken a systematic look of, at what works and what doesn't. And although the Foxcons of the world get a lot of attention, it's only one type of incentive. What are some other types of incentives and some that might be more effective than others? Um, well, let me just first preface. I, I want to make one point kind of in response to what I'm hearing here. One thing I do think we need to be careful in discussing uh, place-based policy is that can mean many different things. And I w think we should be careful about this distinguish between economic development policies and community development policies. And by economic development policies, I see things as aimed at creating jobs in local labor markets. Uh, whatever a local, local labor market is, uh, maybe you think it's small in a metropolitan area, maybe you think it's a county, it's not a neighborhood. Neighborhoods are not local labor markets. Most people don't work in the neighborhood they live in. Plopping jobs in the neighborhood doesn't necessarily do much for the people in the neighborhood. So I think we need to distinguish there. Um, okay, back to the question you asked, which was uh, what's going on in incentives in, in nationally? Well, the, the big growth area in incentives is in job creation credits, which is a clever way states have figured out to give away money without worrying about whether the company has corporate income tax liability. Which is you 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 but but yet claiming you're not doing refundable credits. So what you say is uh, the company gets to keep the workers' personal income tax withholdings for 15 years, the state income tax withholdings, which might be say four or five, whatever the income tax rate is in the state, if it's four percent or five percent. So you essentially keep that for 15 years. And uh, that's the big growth area. Uh, these long-term tax incentives usually going to very large companies. Now, uh, what states are not investing as much in, and this, the, the congressman alluded to this, if you really want to affect the trajectory of a distressed place, there are a lot of things that are more cost-effective than handing out money to large firms. Uh, handing out money to large firms is easy, I mean, you know, easy in the sense that you just write a check, right? I mean, it's easy. We know how to write checks. Uh, but if you really want to affect things, various types of services are much more cost effective. So I pushed in my past work customized business services to the, particularly to small and medium sized companies. Things like manufacturing extension, where you work with small and medium sized manufacturing firms provide them advice on how to improve their competitiveness. I've mentioned customized job training, where you help a firm upgrade its workforce so, so they can be more competitive in the global labor market. I also think you need to deal with some of the basic public services that, like the Congress alluded to. We need not just do job training, but also improve the schools. Preschool can be an economic development program. K-12 can be an economic development program. Investing in infrastructure. We heard earlier about infrastructure costs are ex excessive, but we do need to deal, we, we deal, to deal with infrastructure deficiencies and make selective investments in infrastructure. Just plopping in a bunch of cash incentives, easy to do, uh, but it is not the most effective strategy. There are some estimates that customized business services can have a, can create, uh, have a cost effectiveness of 10 times that of handing out cash incentives. Uh, infrastructure, if done right, can be far more effective in affecting job creation than cash incentives. If you want to boost area wages and earnings, investing in skills, 
whether it's through job training or K-12 or local community colleges or, or uh, locally place-based scholarship programs or preschool programs in the long run is far more effective in boosting earnings per capita than some of these uh, incentive programs. So I think, now I'm not saying we shouldn't use incentives in some cases. I mean, uh, if we cut these back, if we just targeted the most distressed areas, if we cut back on the long-term tax incentives, which are too tempting for governors and mayors, I mean, you know, being able to, to do something that gets you headlines today but passes on the cost to the next governor or mayor, what an attractive thing. <laughs> Why wouldn't you go for that if you're a governor or mayor? Uh, so we need to cut back some of these long-term tax incentives to large companies. We need to target the stressed areas a lot more. We need to target firms that have high multipliers. I mean, a lot of times we're just handing these out to firms and some of the multipliers are very low, and, and yet we know that uh, for example, certain high-tech firms can have much higher multipliers than other firms. So we need to target these things a lot more. I think we could cut back incentives by two-thirds, cut our current bill from $45 billion to $15 billion. That would save $30 billion a year right there. And then we need to talk about investing some of that in distressed places, building up their infrastructure, building up their skills, building up their business ecosystem, working with small and medium-sized businesses. And if we did that, I think we would have much higher bang for the buck in helping distressed places. Now, again, I'm talking about economic development policies. It's a whole other thing talking about neighborhood development policies, a whole other set of issues. Economic development policies that build jobs, Chris mentioned the concern that they'll just lead to uh, uh, essentially people in the area won't gain. That's not really true. I mean, if you actually look at the data, if we boost jobs in the local economy, it will boost the employment rate in the local economy. And it, and it not only does in the short term, it does in the long term. There's one study in Mississippi that shows they started an economic development program back in the 1930s called Balance Agriculture with Industry. And that program attracted some low-wage manufacturing uh, plants to Mississippi. The labor force participation rates in the counties affected by that were still higher, significantly higher in 1960 due to a program that was started in the 1930s. Even after some of the original plants had closed down, the labor force participation rates were significantly higher in counties targeted by this program back in the 1930s. So if you create jobs in the local economy, you will get a short run and long run boost in the employment rate. So Tim has said that he focuses on economic development and not neighborhood policy. Ingrid, you're our neighborhood person. Um, you know, I'm struck by what you said about how, yes, there's, and what Chris corroborated, that there's more inequality between places than within places, and you could look at within place diversity as a real asset, too, that it's um, a diverse labor force, it's a diverse tax base, um, but how do you keep it? You know, I've been struck by the number of places that are dealing with um, what they see as the negative consequences of growth. So um, most famously, a couple of my colleagues actually went at it with competing blogs about Seattle proposed a head tax on high-tech firms so that for every job created above a certain income level, there would be a tax that would then be used to create affordable housing. Um, so, you know, that ended up failing. Um, but you do see these cities like San Francisco that are also grappling with um, this growth that other cities would frankly kill for, but then also um, this question of what does that mean about what they should be potentially doing for their low-income residents. Um, so I, I'm tempted to answer a slightly different <laughs> question, Tracy, which is, um, but, I'll, but I'll come to that, um, which is just, I, I do want to sort of underscore this difference between, um, I completely agree that really it's a different conversation to talk about sort of economic development than, than neighbor at, at sort of a jurisdictional or regional level than it is at a, at a neighborhood level. Um, and I just want to just say very broadly, I mean, they're basically on the neighborhood side, I think there's sort of there, there are two things that you can do, right? You either can invest in poor neighborhoods to improve the quality of life in, in those neighborhoods um, and, and make them more nurturing and, and uh, places that to, to live and for children to grow up in in particular, or you can basically provide incentives to, for people to move around to reduce those concentrations of poverty so you have more equality across neighborhoods. And both of those things are really, neither of them, let's say, is, are, is easy to do. Um, and, and I think that one thing is just sort of in terms of, 
investing, like what do you do about those poor neighborhoods if you want to improve them? You know, the, the research from the Moving to Opportunity program really shows, you know, provides us with this really rigorous evidence that and to prove that neighborhoods matter to the long-term well-being of, of children, but it actually doesn't tell us anything about where to pick up the stick and, and make those neighborhoods better places to live. And I think there is, though, that being said, I think there is other research that suggests that, um, you know, the kinds of, um, uh, you know, I, I think that certainly investing in schools, right, so that to ensure that every child, no matter what neighborhood they live in, can attend a, a high-quality school, investing in safety. So I think we have really strong evidence that violence in particular is devastating to, to children growing up in a neighborhood. Um, I think that it's it's about the basic services, right, to make sure that, that um, you know, we fix the, the, the broken municipal finance system, we, we, we ensure that sort of ba basic services are delivered. On underscore, it really does not, it's not about jobs per se, right? People, again, people are not living in, in generally live in the same neighborhood where they work. A, a lot of attention, I think, even at the community development space is, is paid to, to attracting jobs to particular poor neighborhoods, but I, I don't think that, I think that's, that's the wrong place to go. I think the research shows um, you know, the truth is the research about what matters about neighborhoods is that neighborhoods don't actually seem to, where you live doesn't seem to affect your employment prospects, right, in the short run for adults. What it matters is that it matters for the long-run opportunities for, for children, and it matters for health outcomes and well-being outcomes for adults, but it's, it's not about getting jobs in. Um, there are and I can talk about there are a whole bunch of policies. I, I think I'll leave that aside for the Q and A about ways that you could actually sort of um, reduce poverty concentration and encourage um, economic segregation. I don't know if I no, just just very quickly to answer your question about sort of what kinds of tax policies you might adopt, or well, do you, you want said me to hold that? What you would do with the revenue? So right. I think that's probably more important. But yeah, I yeah. I mean, I would just say that that I think that ultimately, I just want to come back to um, actually, it's work that that. Um, Representative Kildy, you've you've done in your your earlier life is that it, it ultimately, if we care, if if the externality, and the the you know the cost imposed of of growth on on low, moderate, even middle income households is higher land costs and housing prices, then really what we want is a land tax, right? I mean that's really what we want, and I think we really want to try to capture the value of that of that land and it can be some places through through land banking and land trust the work that that you have that you've really spearheaded so now that may not be politically feasible you know it may not be fully technically feasible although i actually think probably it is stay in age but um you know so i i think that obviously other you know it taxing with the, the head tax in seattle the concern is that's going to drive businesses away and and also that it's that it's regressive that it's going to burden disproportionately burden um, lower paid workers. So I think if you're going to move in that direction, I think something like a more progressive payroll tax that exempts the first, you know, thirty, fifty thousand dollars of income would be would be more advisable. I think to be fair, I think the head tax was going to transition to a payroll tax, yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. But I, so Representative Kildy, I've heard you speak very compellingly about the experience of Flint and the emergency manager there. Um, and I've looked a little bit at these state programs to intervene in communities that are in trouble. Um, you know, there are often these metrics that people look at for fiscal health and trying to define what that even means. And you've spoken about the importance of moving beyond a balance sheet approach, um, which I am very sympathetic to having tried to wade through all the various ratios that people look at, and there are a lot of them, and it's not clear how you should weight them or which ones count and which ones don't. But then if you're, if you're moving away from those benchmarks, what kind of benchmarks should we be looking at for a community that's truly healthy? Well, thank you. And it, it's, I think it starts with, um, with resetting some of the conversation um, and get away from the idea that the pe people who live in these most distressed communities, which really is a big part of the problem, this is not some sort of an, Flint's not some sort of an anomaly, it's more of a warning. There are lots of really distressed places in this country, usually the old center of what might be a prosperous region, but now is really struggling. We gotta get rid of this mindset that the reason that those places are struggling is because of either corruption, poor management, or the overhang of pension and health care costs. Even though sometimes there's corruption, sometimes there's bad management, 
And almost always there's the overhang of pension and health care costs. But those aren't the choices that have been made by those folks. Those are the results of choices that have been made that have affected them. The way we fund transportation, land use generally, the municipal finance system, racial avoidance going as far back as, you know, the 50s and 60s, all of those, and globalization, technology changes, all of those outside drivers have conspired against these communities to relocate wealth, economic activity out of these core communities into other parts either of the country or often just other parts of the region. So we start, have to start with the idea that it isn't about punishing or blaming the people who live in these places. The people who live in these places are the ones who are least capable of relocating themselves, otherwise they perhaps would have. They're really poor places. 60% of the children in Flint live below the poverty line and they have the most expensive water in America and you can't drink it. And it's not the fault of the people who live there. So we start with that premise and also understand that municipal governments are essentially creatures of the state government and subject to the systems that states create. Then, then it kind of gets to the question of, well, who owns this problem? My view is largely it's states, but it's also there's a federal interest, a federal responsibility in doing something about it. Starting with that premise, we do use the wrong metrics. We use the balance sheet. We use fiscal answers to what is not necessarily only a fiscal set of questions. So we need to think about service level solvency when we think about what's going on in these places. And rather than looking at getting a place right on the balance sheet, which you can get a city, I've experienced it, I live in one, you can get a city with outside intervention, with the appointment of a receiver, into a place where it's in the black. And it will just be a horrible place to live. But as far as the system that is responsible for oversight of that place, it's in as good a shape as a city 50 miles away that might have very high service levels, parks that are beautiful, maintained, and mowed, all the elements of a civil society that make it livable. But according to the system of municipal finance and oversight of municipal uh, financial systems, both are just fine. And that is just preposterous. So we need to have an entirely new metric that determines when a community has some sort of intervention, one, and secondly, what form that intervention takes. So the form, well, let's start with when. When is when the service level drops below what we determine to be the level of services that we would want ourselves and our families and our kids to live with. It drops below that. Somebody's got to do something. Somebody has to act. Setting aside that it might be, there might be decisions that were made, let's just set that aside for a minute. The fact of the matter is people live in these places and they ought to have a, 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 you know, a standard of living, a standard of experience that is, that is decent. But the second piece of it is, what are the strategies? What are the tactics? What are the tools that are deployed when there is intervention? As it stands right now, it's one thing. So a city that is facing a financial crisis, that is in deep trouble, and is providing barely the basic level of services and can't tax its way to higher quality because the, 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 the pressure is too high. It would drive out more, more, even more of the people and businesses that are there, everybody. The point is this. Right now, the only tool that, that states have when they go to intervene is to go in and cut more, not bring new investment, not flood the zone, with additional resources, but to just cut them to a place where the conditions that cause the flight of wealth and economic, economic activity are even more dire, but they sort of kick the can down the road for a few years. I have not seen a case where this form of intervention actually succeeds. Now, maybe there are some, but in a place where you have highly localized tax bases, and where we once had essentially, to an extent, a three-tier obligation. There was, I'm old enough to remember federal revenue sharing, 
I got elected to local government 42 years ago. I'm 60 years old, so you can do the math. I was 18 years old. If you could have seen me, I'm sure glad it wasn't the digital era. <laughs> I wore my best dashiki to my first school board meeting in Flint. <laughs> but it was a long time ago where there was a significant federal responsibility to make sure these places were sustainable. It wasn't that long ago that there was a significant state responsibility to be the backdrop and provide some level of consistent support so that as a community goes through the job losses associated in our case with the auto sector, we don't have this precipitous loss of tax revenue and a precipitous loss of resources for public services. So we have to get, I mean, there's a sort of the German model you could look at. There's lots of different approaches to this that provide much more stability so that as communities go through the natural ebb and flow that communities go through, there isn't this precipitous loss of public services and the beginning of this downward spiral. We got it all wrong. Uh, I want to underscore something that Congressman Kildee said about sort of the secular forces at work here. I'd highly recommend a Paul Krugman blog called Gambler's Ruin that talks about um, small and medium-sized cities and how even before you think about globalization, that moving away from an agrarian rural society um, means that there are a lot of cities that just don't have much to do anymore, that you, you have um, places like San Francisco that used to be connected to smaller cities in the region that now are much more connected to Shenzhen, China. Um, and so what do you do about these places? Some are lucky, like Rochester, that happen to have a, a certain industry um, um, uh, Kodak, you know, or, or a certain type of skill set that translates into other types of industries. Um, but eventually, luck is going to catch up with you if you're not a big, diversified economy just by virtue of size. Um, so I feel like we could go on and on up here, but we're running out of time, and I want to definitely include the rest of you. Um, so let's move to uh, Q&A, and Wen is with a microphone. So um, Kim and then George. Hi, Kim Rubin, Tax Policy Center. So I'm struck, and thank you all for participating in this, but and part of this is I was in Michigan over the weekend. And I don't know if this would work, but I am struck by the fact that, you know, when you think about Flint, and I saw something where if you look at how Flint was doing, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it was sort of doing really well. I wonder if there's a way that for places and sort of recognizing the ebb and flow of cities and places, whether there is a way to make the case to the state or to the federal government that rather than thinking about it as bailing out these places, sort of recognizing the fact that Flint had given a lot of tax revenue to Michigan in the past. And so if instead of thinking of it as, oh, you're taking all of our money from other places to help these people who are left, if you recognize the fact that I'm guessing that over its history, Flint was actually a donor rather than a receiver to the state government, whether that could help change the conversation. Now, that doesn't necessarily work for places that haven't ever had a boom period to them that are always sort of rural and poor or like who were never booming. But I think that there is this sort of very specific quality of as manufacturing changes and as the economy changes, recognizing the fact that some of these places um, have this past and part of their current problems are because of the past. You know, part of the reason Flint's overhang is so large is because its population was much larger. When you were a booming city and you had all these public services, there were people serving that. And a lot of those people might still be in Michigan or even if they're not. And, is there something where we can change the conversation in that way to sort of try and recognize this not as a, please may I have more, sir, sort of recognizing other or past contributions? Yeah, so sort of a social insurance model. Well, your, your description is quite apt. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, you know, Flint, one of the reasons that Flint's in the situation it's in is that we had 76,000 people in Flint working for General Motors at one point in time in a city that had a population of less than 200,000. And now we have about 10,000 people working for that same company with a two-tiered wage structure. So the loss of that economic activity is just tremendous. We lost half the population, but 90% of the high-wage jobs. And I do think the part of the big problem is this problem, which is a problem that transcends just this policy question. But the fact 
that as policy goes in this country, we have es essentially no long-term memory and no ability to plan beyond the next election, even if that. And I'm almost said it, but I, maybe I shouldn't. And we have a president who's never even read a book. <laughs> so we have a real problem. Um, I shouldn't have said that. I should have just thought it. <laughs> uh, so, but it get, I think it does get to this. There's two pieces. One, uh, real quickly, because I know we have limited time. One, I think, is to get to a notion that we're going to fund, we're, we have a, an obligation to fund a basic level of, of, of services in a civil society, and whatever's going on in a community, that ought to be the guarantee up front. And the truth of the matter is, if we do that, we actually minimize the effect of these job losses because the, the, uh, the relocation isn't quite as rapid in that case. People leave the sinking ship, even if they love the place and they can find some other opportunity. The other piece of it that is something that we are working on is that we've been talking a lot about the question of inequality in sort of the horizontal plane. I think we need to look at the vertical plane as well and look at what just happened in 2017 with the way tax, the tax structure in, this, uh, in our country has exacerbated what is this horizontal problem that's played out on the ground, but it's actually a vertical problem in terms of the way the economy is structured. So one of the things I'm working on, I've introduced legislation to significantly ramp up the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. So while we're dealing with these other pieces, to, to invest in skills and invest in place, basically a people and land approach, we're also saying that there's a floor of decency below which nobody should ever fall, and we ought to have policy that guarantees that there's the basic ability to take care of oneself and one's family, no matter what these other circumstances might affect. I want to add one thing to that. Uh, in thinking about how we might try to sell this to people, uh, as the congressman knows, actually, uh, you know, the poster, Flint's often the poster child for this. You'll hear people say, uh, distressed places, well, you know, if we could just encourage people to just leave Flint or that, that's the solution. Now, I don't like that solution for two reasons, and it's not a solution. Uh, one reason I don't like it, I actually uh, have some prior ties to Flint. I actually worked for, in another lifetime, I worked for Don Regal, who was a congressman from Flint. Uh, My predecessor, yep. twice removed. Uh, and, uh, the other reason I don't like it, though, is that the empirical evidence, and as the Congress indicated, encouraging people to leave a declining place does not help. You're not, you're not helping the people left behind by encouraging people to leave. It actually destroys the percentage change in jobs is about the same as the percentage change in population. You're not, uh, if there's a low employment to population ratio, when you remove people, you destroy as many jobs as the people who leave because it, it affects housing demand, housing values, affects construction, affects retail sales. There are all these demand effects. Labor supply shocks are labor demand shocks. So the notion that you can solve place-based problems with lack of jobs by encouraging out-migration, first of all, people aren't going to move in response to subsidies. Secondly, even if they did, it would it would not help those left behind or probably hurt them. And uh, so it's not a solution. So you need some more positive policy that says, look, maybe we can't get Flint back to, you know, I, you can necessarily get places back to where they were, but you can try to transform them and move them in a positive direction. So I think that's what we should be focused on. Uh, George. Hi, George Friedlander, Court Street Group. I guess I want to start with Chris. Um, I've been, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at implications of technological change for how the the country is going to change. Um, what you, you mentioned the, the the notion of smart people wanting to be with smart people, and some of that has to do with where the tech universities are, and some of it has to do with where the big ten tech co companies care to be, and. I don't know how we get around that impetus. That's number one. Number two, I worry a lot about transportation as a service and move towards less use of gasoline, which is a good thing, but what it means for those economies, less cars being manufactured, which is also probably a good thing, but leaves clusters of regions with, with far less – 
um, attractive jobs. And I don't know what to do with all of that. I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about where we go with it. Yeah, we don't have enough time left. I have a complete solution to that. Um, <laughs> but, no, uh, you uh, no, unfortunately, my, my answer would probably be a little bit uh, not satisfying. But yes, I mean, so I do, it's, it, as I said initially, it's still an area of quite a, a bit of debate of what exactly is, has caused this end of regional convergence. My, my own research is what I kind of alluded to. Uh, it has to do with the fact of this concentration of human capital in an increasingly you know, small number of highly educated places. And, you know, this is a paper I wrote with Ed Glazer, and our argument was that sort of the nature of job creation has changed such that, uh, you know, if you think of somebody like a Henry Ford or a Thomas Edison, these were like relatively, you know, very highly skilled people who created jobs for many low-skilled people and that that was a common pattern, and that what you see in, in a sort of more knowledge-based economy is you have highly skilled people who create jobs for other very highly skilled people like themselves. So con contrast a, a Mark Zuckerberg or a Steve Jobs or a Bill Gates. Um, and, if, if that, and that's our explanation for sort of why we see this concentration and why we see the decline in, in, in regional convergence. And to the extent that there are um, lower wage jobs being created, um, they often go uh, overseas rather than to a, a lower wage part of, of the United States. And so um, I think how you solve that problem, which is just the lack of creation of the, the types of jobs that, that you would need, is an incredibly difficult one. Um, and Tracy alluded to, I think, this, this policy in Seattle is interesting because it kind of says, well, you got to find a way to create some other kind of jobs too as you're, as you're doing this. Uh, I don't know how, obviously it's way too soon to know whether, whether that works, but um, if we're right, it's a very deep problem about sort of the, the nature of innovation in a knowledge economy. Uh, now, we may well be wrong. <laughs> Well, I, I actually just, uh, in preparation for this panel, rewatched David Otter's AEA presidential address, which I also highly recommend, where he talks about, you know, you have the um, Jeff Bezoses of the world creating jobs that are, yeah, I think he almost calls them ghost jobs, right? That they're um, they're low-skilled jobs, but they're very short-lived because they're soon going to be phased out by automation. I, I just want to add one thing. You mentioned tech, and I think that the, both the U.S. economy as well as many local economies would benefit if we put fewer eggs in just Silicon Valley and a few other baskets and spread out tech more widely. And I'm going to plug a book that came out uh, recently that Jonathan Gruber at MIT uh, co-authored. Uh, he's usually better known for healthcare research, but it's actually on, called Jumps, I think it's Jumpstarting America, is that right? Uh, maybe some people in the audience are familiar with it. It's a wonderful book looking at uh, why there are pretty strong arguments for trying to spread high tech to many more areas. And there are many more areas in the US that are suitable for high tech. The notion that you can only do high tech productively in Silicon Valley is frankly ridiculous. Uh, yeah, and, and I just, <laughs> if I can just jump in and just say in the long run, obviously, investing in skills and education is, is key. Just This is super quickly, but I think this is an interesting case where the, policy conclusions may be exactly the opposite depending on, on what you believe. So the, a lot of people complain about the, the price of housing and land, say in Silicon Valley, is getting so high. Uh, one response is to want to make it lower um, and have a lot of policy innovations to do that. Another possibility is, if, you know, if Tim is right, it's probably good that it's becoming too expensive for more people to locate there because it will then will have to spread out. But which of those two things you believe is going to really depend on whether you want policy number one, which is how do we lower the price of housing here, versus policy number two, which is let it, let it be high and let, the, let things spread out. So I just want to take a, a completely different tack on this because I've been thinking about these same issues in terms of where are the successes that help leapfrog across income levels to success. And I thought about the sports model. And it's, it's right in front of our very eyes. If, you, if we, we all know in this room that in order to have a world-class soccer team in the United States, you need to start young, you need to work with the kids on the street, you need to help provide them resources. Recruiters are out there and they'll find kids that have talent, natural talent. They'll pluck them out, work with them. They have a team that they work with. They may actually, the coach takes them under their wing in many cases. 
provides extra snacks, may even buy the sneakers for some kids that can't afford them. The model extends also into music and celebrities in some cases, fashion models. I'm thinking of some of the, the careers that are out there. Why can't we apply those similar models to STEM, to work with science, technology, and math? Um, anyhow, I don't know the answer to the question. I don't know if anybody on the panel knows it, but I think that that metaphor is a good one to think about. If I could just comment. First of all, I understand and I agree with apply the model to STEM, but I think we ought to just stick with the model because kids who are exposed to music and arts and other of those experiences, yeah, I mean, <laughs> and, and, and again, for me, everything always comes back to Flint. It used to be the largest monosyllabically named city in the United States. <laughs> and then I discovered that Kent Washington annexed, so they cheated. <laughs> but I think we should pay really close attention to, say, some of the work. I don't know if you've read Putnam's book, Our Kids. Look at the disparity in terms of these sorts of experiences that young children have in communities of poverty, this goes to this essential public service notion because in the places we're talking about, there's not a park that is mowed or maintained. There is not an opportunity for those sorts of outlets. So when I put together the federal response to the Flint water crisis, we just laid out what we thought every that we should have for Flint. I introduced this legislation and I realized after I wrote it, wait a minute, this isn't just what's good for Flint kids. This should be good for every kid. What we discovered is the ability to develop the brain to overcome the effect of lead in the drinking water, which is a neurotoxin. The most effective way to overcome that is what we were talking about. Get these kids these experiences that expand and grow their brain and create new neural pathways, and their trajectory is dramatically different. So I think this notion that planting the, seed, the seeds early on is something that we're, we're sort of missing in a way that... Uh, is disproportionately negatively impacting those kids who live in desolate places, but are especially poor kids who don't have a way to get to the experiences that expand their minds. I see Ingrid nodding, which is her way of saying that, yes, the research corroborates all of that. And I also see that we are out of time. So I'm so sorry. I have a whole list of questions I didn't even get to. Um, but I did observe in my questions that we have superstar cities. And I think you'll all agree that we have superstar panelists. So please thank me and thank you for joining me. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.